So if you would, we will stand for the honor of reading God's word in 1 Kings chapter 15, starting with verse 5. Starting with verse 4, sorry. It says, Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem, setting up his son after him and establishing Jerusalem. Because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Let's pray. Lord, this morning, I, I just pray that you give us ears to hear, Lord, uh, that today we would uh, hear from the Spirit of God and that you'd speak truth over us. Lord, I pray for every one of our fathers, God, that you would just let us be the men that you've called us to be, help us to honor you and live for you. Lord, for everyone here, I pray that they would put their hope and trust in you. Help me to preach plain and clear today. I realize that there is a strict judgment on my life and rotten dividing your word of truth, and I do accept that place. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray, in his name that I preach. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, we live in an era of cancel culture where people are always trying to go back in your past and find something you said or a place you were at or an action that you did and, and get you and ha-ha and see, they're really not that kind of a person and, and so let's just discredit everything that the person may have done that has been good. Um, I'm glad God doesn't operate his kingdom like that. Amen? I, I'm, I'm glad that God does show grace and favor and the thing about the scripture that I am so glad of and one of the reasons why I just believe it's truly authentic is that, you know, if you're writing about the king, I mean, this is the king of Israel. This is David. He's the greatest king. You might want to gloss over his sin, right? You know, I kind of kind of hide that. But boy, it doesn't hide it. The Bible does not hide the sin of David. We've been reading in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. We've been seeing David's life. And David has been faithful and he'd been, he'd been pursuing God. And everything up to this point in his life was, was really going like how God had been orchestrating. He'd been pursuing the Lord. He's now uh, at the age of 45 to 55 years old. And, and now he's in, he's in his, his, in his house. And he's entering a moment uh, where... This scripture talks about in 2 Samuel chapter 11. So if you have your Bible, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. That's where we will be in today's message. And it says, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbi. But David remained at Jerusalem. Let's just pause right there for a moment and let's capture what the author here is trying to set before us as he geniusly writes in a way that tips us off as a reader that David is about to be in trouble. Why is he about to be in trouble? Well, because this was the time when kings were to be at war. David is a king. Where does it say that David remained? In Jerusalem. In his house. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. We are at war every day. We are at battle every day. The Bible tells us to put on the armor of God. Not just a piece, but the whole armor of God. Put the helmet of salvation on our head, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. We are to shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We're to take the sword of the spirit on our hand and the shield of faith. And we are to battle because our weapons are not flesh that come against us, but they're spiritual in nature. And they battle within us and rage within us the fleshy desires that come to our heart and our mind. And if we're not ready to do battle every single day, and if we're not on the battlefield every day, we're going to be in trouble. David should have been at war with his men, but yet he stayed at home. 
he wasn't where he was supposed to be. And what happened in verse 2 is telling of his neglect. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw, I would circle the word saw if I had my Bible out, he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. This is the incident that First Kings is talking about. That David had fully followed God and he was a God after man's own heart and he pursued him and served him faithfully except for with Uriah the Hittite. Now I want to bring attention to some things, guys. One of the reasons why he got himself in trouble is because he wasn't where he was supposed to be. If we want to make sure that we are engaged with what God is doing in our life, as fathers, as husbands, we need to be where we're supposed to be. Some of the problems is we get ourselves in places we're not supposed to be. Sometimes in work, we find ourselves in places we ain't supposed to be. Sometimes we spend too much time in the lunchroom when we should be back at the job because sometimes it's in those lunchroom, the chats get going, and they go in a direction that it shouldn't go in. Sometimes in the office, there's a pass-by, and, and there's, a, there's a comment that's, that's made and a conversation that's struck up between someone that you should be uh, not speaking with and actually some comments that are being made that shouldn't be made to them but should be made to your spouse. Guys, fa- husbands, fathers, you should, you should never, ever, uh, in, in an office place, anywhere, uh, anywhere out, even at, at Walmart or wherever it might be, you, you see a, a, a lady and you're talking to them and, and tell them how pretty they look. Like, you look awful pretty. <laughs> oh, thank you. Because here's what might happen. Sometimes we do a bad job as husbands telling our wives they look pretty. Uh, husbands, you need, we need to include, I'm, ta- I'm preaching to myself too, you need to make sure that we're telling your wife you look pretty today. Because if you don't do it, somebody else will. And some other man may, may, may say that, that you look pretty. She might think, well, my husband never tells me that. And then it starts. Then there's, there's a start. There's, a, there's an exchange. There's an exchange that happens. Be careful. Be careful with the text. It may seem innocent, but boy, it's a Pandora's box that's about to open a floodgate of consequences. A phone call. Whatever. Just be careful. Some, some, some guys... Uh, you need to go back home after work. You stay too long afterwards. You need to be back at the house with your kids, spending some time with them. Be at the ball field with your family, sitting next to your wife. I go some places and I'm thinking, why is she standing so close to him? And where is his wife? And where's her husband? What's going on? People aren't where they're supposed to be. Go to work. Provide for your family. Come home. Love your family. Work hard all day long. Come home to your wife and kids. Your wife might be working all day long. She might be be tired. And and, and you're, you're embracing one another and you're investing time in your family. Be where you're supposed to be. Do what you're supposed to be doing. If you're that, then you're going to be good. David wasn't doing either. He wasn't where he's supposed to be. He wasn't doing what he's supposed to be doing. He wasn't battling. He's up there on his housetop. He'd taken a a nap, you know. He was resting, and everybody else was battling. And he's up there on the rooftop, and all of a sudden he's stretching out, you know what. And then all of a sudden, whoa. Somebody catches his eye. Bathsheba. She was pretty. The Bible says she was pretty. Attractive. Catches her eye, catches his eye. 
And he starts looking, he starts thinking, man, you know. Now, let's go back to verse 2 and let's look at this. Look at verse 2. I want you to see a word here. He saw from the roof. If you have your Bible, circle the word saw. He saw from the roof. Verse 3. And David sent and inquired. Circle the word sent. He saw. He sent for. And then verse 4. Look at verse 4. So David sent messengers and and what? Took her. And he lay with her. Now the Bible specifically says that she was washing from her uncleanliness. That is, that she was washing from her cycle, which, which is letting us know that this child is definitely David's. Okay. Definitely David's. He saw... He wanted, so he took. He saw, he wanted, he took. Oh, he started feeling things. Oh, his feelings started stirring up inside of him. Woo! Oh, she's pretty. And she, he started looking at her. He started lusting after her. And he, it went beyond just, just the glance and the look. It went beyond just, oh, she's an attractive lady. No, it was an attractive I see her. I want her. So I'll take her. I see it. I want it. I take it. I see it. I want it. I take it. Sound familiar? Eve, we are told, when she saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eye to make one wise, she took it and she ate it. She saw it. She wanted it. She took it. That'll get you in trouble every single time. I see it. I want it. I'll take it. James chapter 1 verse 13 says this. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. James makes it real clear. When you do something that is ungodly, unrighteous, that does, goes against God, it's not God's fault. He's not tempting you. He's not making you do it. And guess what? It's not even the devil's fault. It's your fault from your own desires I see it I want it I'll take it see temp being tempted is not a sin okay we know that scripture tells us that Jesus in all like manners was tempted as we but yet without sin so being tempted is not sin. Oh, that's an attractive lady. Okay, now what are you going to do with that? Are you going to sit there and keep staring and looking and saying, oh, I want, and so I'm going to take, or do you just put it to death? We are in a spiritual battle every single day. What do you do when your flesh begins to raise up and speak to you, and you get all these feelings that you want to do something that you know that God says is out of bounds? What do you do? Well, the Bible tells us that we are at war within us. As a, as a child of God, we got the Spirit of God living in us, but the old flesh nature still in us. How many of y'all ever hear that old flesh keep speaking to you, huh? And, and, and we have the power, though, to resist that and put that to death. That's why we take up the cross daily. That's why we are to put the, deed, the, death, the deeds of the lust of the flesh and walk in the power of the Spirit. We have to put that to death so that we can walk into righteousness. Fathers, we have to be carefully guarding where we are and what we're doing 
so that we are the men that God's called us to be. We need to be where God's called us to be and do what God's called us to do so we can be who God's called us to be. We need to take responsibility. I, I, I know we live in a culture where we don't like to take responsibility. Because if we do something and we get caught, what is our go-to move? We blame people. We blame somebody. We blame, we blame our environment. We, we br- blame our parents. We blame our sibling. We, we like to blame, right? Adam and Eve, that was good, right? At, what did Eve do when God called e- uh, Eve out? Well, he called Adam out, and Adam said, it's Eve. Then Eve said, it's the devil, right? Just blame it on down, just shift it on down. And what did they do once their eyes were open? They went and what? Hid and tried to cover their own shame. We do two things. We blame and we cover. We make excuses. We try to cover our sin. (gasps) So nobody finds out. David finds out she's pregnant. No doubt it's his baby. This is a problem. The king has just committed adultery. He's violated God's command. He sinned against God. But he thinks nobody knows but just a few people. And so let's do a cover-up. Any of y'all ever scheme, huh? Any scheming going on? Y'all ever doing scheming? Because so what do you do when you get caught? Well, you go to scheme number one. All right. Now, okay. Now, the, the, the right thing would have been to take responsibility and just confess to the minute and made it right, right there in the spot. But, you know, that's too easy. We don't want to do it that way. We like to do it the cover-up way. And so he covers it up. He Gets a messenger out to drugs. Just, hey, send, send your rob back. You all come back. I've, I've got some things I just want. I just want to bless you all. So, so he sends for him. Joab comes back. You know, Uriah's, you know, Uriah's coming back. And he, he brings Uriah to him. He's like, you know, so, so what? how's everything going, Uriah? You know, battle going good. Yeah, Joab doing well on the battlefield. Yeah, good. You doing well. You know, men doing well. Yeah. Here's a gift for you, Uriah. I just, you know, you've worked so hard. You've done such a good job. I just wanted you to come and, and just have a little relaxing day, you know. And, and I know you've been at war, and you must be tired, and you haven't seen your wife for a long time. And, you know, I just wanted you all to, to come back and, you know, you know, <laughs> have some fun. Just enjoy yourself, you know, you know. It's been a while. Sounds like a pretty good scheme. But Uriah is more noble than David. Uriah sleeps at the foot of the door. He doesn't go in his house. David finds out about that. And thinks, what? Why, why would you do that? And, and, and Uriah's like, my men don't have that privilege. And we're at war. And so if they're not able to come and enjoy the luxury of being back home... I, I won't either. I will, not be, I will not enjoy that and take advantage of that until the war is done. So what happens when scheme one doesn't work? Go to scheme two. David's like, all right, let's have a party. He invites, gets a party going on, gets him drunk. You know, give him some wine, loosen him up a little bit, you know. Maybe he'll... he'll, he'll Get back to the house, you know, and problem be solved. He gets him drunk, but here's the bad news for David. A drunk Uriah is still more noble than a sober king. He doesn't go in the house. What happens when scheme two doesn't work? Third time's a what? Sean, bot, this third time. Pause right now, this thing, you know. Oh, what a dangling web we weave 
when we first practice what? To deceive. Oh, he's being very deceptive. David gets a very cold heart. Sin, sin will harden you. Sin will harden you to the affections of anyone else but yourself. It'll make you only care about yourself. And let me, t- let's, let, let me just tell you how cold-hearted David had gotten. David writes a letter, seals it, okay? Now, it's a sealed letter by the king. You're not opening that unless the person who's told to open it opens it. If so, consequences. He writes a letter, seals it, hands it to Uriah, and tells Uriah, go give this to Joab. Uriah doesn't know it, but he's carrying his death sentence. Hands it to Joab. Joab opens it up. And it says, make sure to put Uriah in the front line to ensure his death. That's cold. Sin will harden you. Fathers, be careful. We teach our little kids a little song. Be careful little eyes, what you see. Be careful little ears, what you hear. Be careful little feet where you go, right? The Father up above, looking down on you. Love, be careful little eyes, what you see. Now, Joab goes, takes the orders. He, he finds an area where he knows there's valiant men fighting. And he sends Uriah there and tells him, go charge. Go charge the line. He sends him into the heat of the battle of some vicious warriors. And he is killed in battle. Joab gets a messenger and he says, go to the king. Here's what you need to say. You go to the king and say that a bunch of our men have died. But they have fought valiantly, and they were storming the walls. And, uh, and if he were to say, well, while were you near the wall, you know the danger of that. You tell him this, Uriah is dead. He goes back to the king, and King David asks him, how, how, how is everything? He says, several of our men have died. There's been a big battle, but Uriah is dead. Now. Again, think of David right now. He's only worried about one thing, covering up his sin. He's just worried about himself. His response wasn't that he was grieved that many of his men died in battle. His response was simply to summarize it like this. Well, tell Joab that's the cost of doing war. Tell him, it's okay. No concern for anyone else. Here's what you need to know. Here's what I need to know. Here's what we all need to know. Fathers, husbands, wives, mothers, your sin doesn't just impact you, but it impacts a whole lot of other people around you. Innocent people are affected by your sin. You think, oh, it's just, it's just me. It's just, it's just my decision. It's just, what, it's just my life. It's not just your life. It's not just what you do. It impacts and affects all kinds of people around you, and sin will harden you. Sin will make you cold. It'll make your hard heart, your heart hard, and it brings severe consequences. Unintended consequences, things that you never thought might happen. Here's what David forgot to realize. He thought he had gotten away with it, but in verse 27 it says, Bathsheba, she mourns. And it says then, after the mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. The thing that David had done 
displeased the Lord. David thought he had gotten away with his sin. He thought he had covered up. Wasn't he a genius trying to figure out this plan to let, make sure nobody found out? But what the author lets us know, it doesn't matter if man doesn't find out. The Lord sees and he knows. And that wasn't pleasing to the Lord. So God sends a prophet to David. Nathan. Chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, he gives him a little story. There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. And the rich man had very many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought. And he brought it up and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie on his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or her to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. You see how hard, hard he was and how self-righteous David was. He was the king. He could make rulings on a case such like this. But he even went overboard because to take a man's lamb wasn't to bring death upon a man. It was just to restore to them fourfold the, the loss that they took. But he says, this man ought to be killed. And, and, and he's indignant about that. And then Nathan looks at him and he says, you are the man. It's you, David. You're the one that took that lamb. You're the one. You had a plenty of wives. You had Saul's harem. You had everything that Saul had now was yours by default. And you had everything that you needed. But yet this one man, he had his wife. You took her. You're the man. And he says, thus says the Lord. This is a word from God. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives under your arms and gave you a house for, of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would have added you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. Pleasure never pacifies the human desire. And sin never satisfies the human soul. Did you notice what the Lord said to David? You had everything that you needed. Anything that you wanted. You had all the pleasure. Everything that you could ask for. You had it. Whatever it was. I didn't withhold anything from you, but yet because you saw a lady that you saw, thought was beautiful and, and she wasn't yours, you thought you could just take her for yourself. I see, I want, so I took. I see it, I want it, I take it. I see it, I want it, I take it. Our whole culture is built on this lure of lust. I see it, I want it, I take it. Oh, the advertisements, they run through. They're profiling you. They're watching your Facebook. They're watching your Instagram. They know what you're looking at. They know what you like. Here comes the ads. Oh, you talk about something. Whoop, there it is, you know, and, and, you're, and you're going through. I see it because if I see it and I want it, what will I do? I'll take it. I'll see it, I want to take it. And, and it's a rabbit hole, it's a hole that leads deep into darkness. The porn industry is a great example of that. I see it, I want it, oh, I'll take it, I'll see it, I want to take it. I'll click on this, oh, I like that, and I'll watch that, and I'll feast on that. Oh, I need a little bit more, and then I 
click on that. And it's not just the men, but men lead the way, but yet women, you all are starting to get trapped and sucked in that as well. And it's a darkness of a hole that you fall into, and you start watching things, and you watch things, and then that doesn't satisfy, so you got to get a little... St- deeper a little deeper a little darker a little darker and before you know it you're lost in darkness because sin when it is acted upon gives birth to death gambling industry same thing oh i see it i want it i take it starts with a five dollar bet Oh, well, this is $5, $5 bet. Then it becomes a $10 bet. Then it's a $20 bet. Then, then you're laying a 50 down. Then it's a 100 down. And then before you know it, you're up to $500. And then you're having trouble paying your bills. And you don't know what's going on. And so you cover it up and you try to lie. And then you're, you're, you're trying to scheme to make sure your wife doesn't know about it. I see it. I want it. I take it. I see it. I want it. So I take it. And it leads us down a path of darkness. The LGBT movement, that's an example of pleasure never pacifies and sin never satisfied because it used just to be a gay right movement, just a gay rights movement. Then it was the LGB movement. I see it, I want it, I take it, I see it, I want it, I take it. It's never enough, never enough. The Bible says the eye is always seeing, but never full of sight. The ear is always hearing, but never full of hearing. I see it, I want to take it. Because then it's the LGBTQ movement. Oh, we got to get deeper and darker, and we got to go further. It's the LGBTQI movement. I, I saw something on, on Bill Maher, and Bill Maher by no means is an evangelical Christian. By no means. And, and he had a, a, had a bit on that there's 96 recognized pride, pride flags. 96 now. And he went through them. And so I was I piqued my curiosity. So I did my own research. I looked at humanrightscampaign.org. And I looked at queerintheworld.com. Who recognized 50 flags during this month. 50 Lesbian pride, trans-inclusive, bisexual, pansexual, asexual, all kinds of sexual preferences. Queerintheworld.com had, had a list of, and showed the picture, showed what it looked like, what it was, gave description. A gender, that first to a person who does not identify themselves as having a particular gender. You have a romantics, they have their own flag, the a romantics, that is, people have no interest and desire for a romantic relationship. You have the gay bear brotherhood pride flag. Gay bear brotherhood pride flag. That's, that's gay men that have beards and that are hairy. They've, they, there's a particular flag just for that. Now here is what I want you to listen to because we have to stop and think. We have to think. We have got to engage our brain because what I have been told by many is that uh, and I've read it in literature, and it's been the, the, common, the common statement is that you're born that way. You're, you're, just, you're born either gay or you're straight. You're just, that's something you're just born that way. But however, in this month of pride, there is a flag, abrosexual, that means this. It's a person, this person has a fluid sexual orientation and may experience different sexual orientations over time. They may be one sexuality today and be another tomorrow. The time frame to change an abrosexual individual's sexual orientation doesn't matter. And it could be hours or years before they identify as different sexuality. So within hours, they could change Or it could be years. Now let's think. Let's engage our mind. That completely contradicts those who say you're born that way. Because now this flag is waving and saying there are people who 
They can change. They just change. It just changes. Could be within the hour. It could be years. And if that is true, then we need to make sure that we're sounding the alarm for all of these children that are being taken advantage of and abused at 10, 11, and 12 year old and allowed to be given a sex change. which is child abuse, especially if within the next hours they could change their mind. Or the next years they could change their mind, but yet we've allowed something to happen. We've allowed a a child to make a decision that is life-altering that cannot be reversed. It, it is time for us as American people and believers in Christ to say, we've got to stop the insanity and the darkness that this is going towards and say, enough's enough. It's got to stop. We are killing our children. Because I see it, I want it, so I take it. I see it, I want it, I take it. And we fall deeper and darker, and more and more further into sin and darkness. Pleasure never pacifies. Sin never satisfies. So whatever you experiment with, it'll always be more than that. The flesh will always hunger for more than that and will be lured away further and further away from God's design. And what happens when we go against God's word and his ways is consequences. I have tried to drill in the brain of my two kids from an early age. I would say to them, good choices have good consequences and bad choices have bad consequences. Fathers, you can destroy your family by one dumb decision. By one time giving in to your lust of your flesh because you saw it and you wanted it, so you took it. And it can have consequences that ripple out all through generations. What do you do when you've sinned? You don't cover it up. And you don't scheme. We have a good word in the Bible. It's called repent. Now David thought he got by with it, but then there was a man of God that confronted him, and God revealed to him his sin. And here's what David said in verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned. Against the Lord. I've sinned. I did it. No one else, I did it. He he took responsibility. At least he took responsibility this time. This was the difference between David and Saul. Saul, when he was confronted, no, he tried to still try to manipulate and try to give an excuse and try to rationalize. uh, But David, at least he says, yes, I sinned against God. And then Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sins. You shall not die. He says, David, your sins have been forgiven. Aren't you glad that God can forgive us of our sin? Aren't you glad that no matter how far we go in darkness, no matter how far we go away from God, if we will turn to him and confess our sin, he is faithful and just and willing to forgive us of our sin and make us right before him. And we can be restored to our heavenly father. And so he calls out, and, and he says, he's, 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 he's forgiven you, David. Nevertheless, uh, because of this deed, you have, uttered, you have utterly scorned the Lord. The child whom is born, who is born to you shall die. You're forgiven, David. God's not going to destroy you. Because you deserve death because of the sin you committed, deserved the death. 
that that son is going to die. Fathers, husbands, mothers, wives. The choices you make, sons and daughters, I would add, the choices you make, they, not, they just don't affect you. They affect other people. The sword would never be removed from David's house. God had promised him an everlasting kingdom, and he would be true to that promise, but the sword would never leave David's family. His sons, one of his sons would rebel against him and try to take his kingdom away. He would die. One of his daughters would be raped by one of his sons. Tragedy after tragedy struck his home. The kings that followed David, only about three of the kings were righteous and they weren't even fully righteous. They were wicked and it was conniving, it was death, it was destruction, it was pierced through. Through suffering and heartache. Yes, God can forgive you. But the decisions you make, you may live with the consequences for years on out. Here's the thing, I, I never preach an easy gospel. I, I never say... You know, come to Jesus and, and all of your life, it'll be perfect from here on out and, and it'll be great hereafter <clears throat> because that's not necessarily true. Because here's what, come to Jesus and you can be saved and forgiven of your sin and given new life in Christ Jesus. But the consequences of choices that you make, you may live with years down the road. Young people, listen. You're sexually active today. There could be a disease you live with the rest of your life. I see it, I want it, I take it. I see it, I want it, I take it. You could start drinking a drink, start smoking a, 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 a joint, and it might make you feel good for the moment, but it might take you down a path of destruction. Fathers, <coughs> husbands, ah, oh, it's just a drink with the guys. Maybe. But that drink from the guys may lead to more, may lead to an addiction. I've had many, I know many cops, and I ask them, Domestic calls. How many domestic calls are alcohol related? Majority of them. Alcohol, drug related. Majority of them. It's going to be very rare that a man is in his home loving his wife like Christ loved the church. And praying for his wife and praying for his children and leading his children in the things of God that are going to be abusive to their kids and their wives. David prayed one of the best prayers. He wrote it out in a psalm. Won't read it all, but I'll read the first part of it. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. That psalm was written about his sin with Bathsheba. What do you do when you have sinned against God? You confess it. You call to the Lord and ask for his mercy and his grace. 
Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. This is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. The son of David. Because of that sin that David committed, the Lord told him, The sword will never depart from your house. That means death will never depart from your house. There was a God in heaven who said, I'll take responsibility and I'll break the curse. And the son of David, who was the son of God, who lived a perfect life, went all the way to the cross. And when he was arrested and betrayed, and Peter said, do you want us to grab our swords? And Jesus said, no. He who lives by the sword dies by the sword. Mm -mm. No, he Jesus was going to defeat this by his own sacrifice. That his death would be the final death of the son of David. That on the cross of Calvary, Jesus would take on all the sin of the world. Take on the sin of his, his, of his forefathers and the sin of humanity. And, the, and, and on the cross there, Jesus would suffer the judgment of God the Father. His wrath would come upon him so that we might be set free from our sin and forgiven because of the wrath that should have fell upon us fell upon his son and Jesus said I'll pay for their sin I'll take on their sin and that whoever believes in me will not perish but have everlasting life dads do you know the Lord Do you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you given your heart and life to Christ? If you have never surrendered your life to Christ, I know men, our pride gets in the way. I don't need to ask for forgiveness. We think we can work it out ourselves. Guess what? You'll never work out or earn out your own salvation. There's King David couldn't do it. Solomon couldn't do it. No, no, no one's Jesus. This morning, if you need a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask you at this invitation to come and place your faith in Him. Ladies, you'll never do it on your own. You'll never be the mother you're supposed to be, the wife you're supposed to be, the son, the daughter you're supposed to be. You'll never be who you are until you come into the true encounter of the God who made you. And then you become new. A salvation, everlasting life given to all who trust in him. So, this morning, salvation is offered. Grace, mercy, all the sin that you've committed can be forgiven today. Thanks to what Jesus did on the cross. So, if you're covering your sin, hiding your sin, you think no one's going to find out about it, God knows about it. And be sure of this, the Bible is true your sin will find you out. So I'd confess it. And I'd call upon the mighty name of the Lord to be saved. Amen. Let's, let's pray. Lord Jesus, you and you only forgive us of our sin. Lord, we might try to cover it. We might try to hide it. But Lord, we can never remove it. And so, Father, if there's someone here today that needs to trust you as Lord and Savior, they need to call upon your name, they need, they need to repent of their sin, I pray today they would come. If there's any man, there's any woman, boy, girl here today that needs to trust in you, that today they would trust in Christ. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.